Jesus is coming again, he's coming in power and glory to reign. Coming with all the heavenly hosts, what a glorious time that will be. See the signs fulfilled one by one, study his word, be watchful and wait. He's coming soon like a thief in the night. Have you picked up the Jesus thing now? He's coming again, he's coming in power and glory to reign. Coming with all the heavenly hosts, what a glorious sight that will be. Let me say a pleasant Sabbath to everyone, especially those joining us on the various virtual social media platforms welcome to another bible class we continue on the topic biblical and theological foundations of family life last week i did promise that before i am through with my three sessions the three sabbaths i would invite my wife and so welcome dan to this another bible class time as we focus on family life and so at this time we will lift our hearts to God for him to guide us as we go into this Bible class let's pray Holy Father we are happy to be in your presence again to open your words bless it O oh God and may it find a place in our hearts so we can truly reflect you to the world the person and family you would have us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So we continue <clears throat> with the topic, Biblical and Theological Foundations of Family Life. And so we're looking as we move forward toward a theology of family. Several major assumptions drawn from biblical study and theological reflection undergird Christian family relationships. So we need to understand that there are certain basic assumptions, and we're going to be sharing some of these assumptions, that uh, we hold when we think of Christian family relationships. So God is a relational being. Very important to note that. God is a relational being who has made human beings for relationships. I want Sister Fletcher to read for me Genesis chapter 1. That's Genesis 1, 26 through to 28. You will notice that there are some other passages. But we will not be able to read everything. But verses 26 to 28 is a starter for us this afternoon. Okay. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And you can follow with us as I read. And then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Notice, he created male and female in his image and in his likeness. Yes? Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be The first commandment he gave to Adam and Eve is? A blessing. To be fruitful and multiply. So God told them in his first commandment, go and have sex. That's wow. Right. Be fruitful. Go and have a sexual relationship. And be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Continue. And subdue it. Yes. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
So God often reveals himself to us in family terms. From him, we learn of marriage. Yes. And Isaiah 54, Sister Fletcher, and verse 5 is another passage that speaks to how God is a relational being and who has made us as human beings um, to have relationship with him and to have relationship with each other. And so, from him, we learn of marriage. Isaiah 54 and verse 5. And it reads, for your maker is your husband. Wow, you see the kind of um, relational language that is used. That's right. And the Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. Right. So, um, we learn of marriage from him. Yes. The parent-child relationship. And we can look at those. We're not going to have time to explore that. Deuteronomy 1, 31 and John 20 and verse 17. And so, the family was instituted by the creator as his primary setting for human development and nurturance. Since family is the primary place where the capacity for love and intimacy with God and other human beings is developed, and it is where spiritual values are transmitted to across generations, it is central to the disciple-making process. So when God made man, he made him in the context of family. He didn't make him in isolation. You will notice that when he made everything, he said it was very good. But when he made man, before he made man plural, that is before Eve came into the being, he said of all creation, he said it is not good that the man should be alone. So he made the woman with the man so that the, when um, man is made, before the day was through, he made him a in companion. the context of family That's with right. a companion. That's right. Someone that he could have relationship with. That's right. Yes? A companion from the heart of God. The image of God is expressed in human beings as male and female. We, we saw that in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. You see, God is plural. I shared that last week. That God is plural. And, for God, and God being love, he was always plural to express that love within himself. And so making man in his image, for man to truly reflect the plurality of God, man had to be plural. And so God made man male and female in his image. The creator's act of bringing the two together as equals, notice, as equals in a monogamous heterosexual union established the pattern for marriage. What do we mean by those big words? Yes, you need to explain it to us. Monogamous. Mono means singular. <clears throat> One. So it is one partner, heterosexual, opposite sexes. So we should have one partner who is opposite sex to us in that marital union. So it is one man to one woman, one woman to one man in a marriage relationship. And in this union, it provides companionship, fulfillment, and the perpetuation of the human family. That's God's original design. So God created, God created us. And as human beings, we procreate. That is what he The perpetuation plans. of the human family. And procreation can only happen. Between a man and a woman. Between one man and one woman. In the context of marriage. In the context. That's which the should ideal. That's the ideal. That's the ideal. Exactly. And we're speaking of the Christian context to know. That's right. And the relationship of the sexes in marriage has been distorted by sin. 
Because what are we seeing? We see Genesis 3, 16. Pastor, you want to just, just read that one? All right. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's look at what that text says. It and says here, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Right. So because of sin... Marriage had its challenges, but redeemed by Christ, and we see that in Matthew 20 and verse 26 and 27, Christ had to come in the picture to save mankind and to save marriages too. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 and 27. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your servant yes verse 26 let him be your minister and whosoever will be chief among you let him be your servant and so while there has been a distortion because of sin through christ god has restored our endeavors are in a process of restoration for the marriage relationship because we see that Christ makes a difference in the marriage of Christians. Exactly. I, I don't know what I would do if Christ was not in my marriage. He does make a big difference. A mutuality prevails that restores the Edenic ideal. He is able to satisfy our longing so that we can reflect his character. Yes. Husbands and wives are heirs together of the grace of life exactly so there is that mutuality that's right both the man and the woman um they are mutually equal mutually valuable to god um as it was originally in that edenic um ideal now the covenant of marriage on principles of love loyalty exclusivity trust and support upheld by both partners both partners that's right so loyalty is not just for the woman's sake or for the man's sake it is for both partners and when these principles are violated through abuse abandonment or other instances of unfaithfulness to the marriage vow the essence of the marriage covenant is endangered and despite the high biblical ideals for marriage and the divine power that is available to enable marriage commitment to endure some individuals will not survive in marriage can you imagine exactly we spoke last week <clears throat> about god's ideal and the real god is always pointing us to the ideal the truth but then man has fallen and as a result in our family life ministries in the church while we uphold the ideal we must realize that there are some marriages that will not survive there are some marriages that will fail and the church must also give that kind of care and support to these individuals whose marriages did not work very important and so at times even though it's irretrievable at times irretrievable breakdown of the marriage can occur scripture acknowledges that tragic circumstances may destroy the marriage covenant jesus taught that the marriage covenant may be irrepa irreparably broken through sexual immorality one partner cheats on the other let's look at the text for that because um some people believe that uh, that once you're married regardless of whatever happens then you must remain married now <clears throat> we believe that couples should get all the support necessary so that they can stay together and that is the ideal that they should stay together but we recognize that there are some irretrievably um irreconcilable differences differences and breakdown that occur in marriages and jesus recognized this 
in Matthew 5 and verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. In other words, if it is not for sexual immorality. And this fornication, the word fornication, comes from the Greek pornia. Pornia is a, a Greek word that means sexual immorality. Not just fornication um, in terms of sex outside or before, because in its natural original sense in the English, fornication means having sex before your marriage, and adultery means having sexual relationship outside of the marital union. But how it is used here in Matthew 5, 32, it speaks to, um, for the cause of fornication, sexual immorality. So any yeah. other deviance, sexual deviances? That occur outside of the marital relationship. Yes, then this is can be a reason. It not, doesn't have to be, but it can be a reason for divorce and remarried. And it continues. And uh, that whatsoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, cause it her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. Let's look at chapter 19 as well, because it's important that we explore this passage very well that's matthew chapter 19 and verse 9 and i say unto you whosoever shall put away his wife except it be for fornication and shall marry another similar text committed adultery and whosoever married her which is put away doth commit adultery and so it is clear that the only biblical cause, as it is expressed here in the book of Matthew, Sister Fletcher, is sexual immorality. That's, That's the only given reason here so far. We have some others we're going to share. But that's the only biblical reason for divorce and remarriage so far expressed in the first book of the New Testament. But Paul also indicated another reason that can end the marriage covenant. And that is through death and we find that in Romans 7 verse 2 and 3 let me read that Romans chapter 7 verse 2 and 3 says for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives but if the husband dies she is released from the law of her husband so then if while her husband lives and she marries another man she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So this is clear. What it's saying, once your partner has died, it has freed you to remarry. To remarry. It right. has freed you from the marital covenant. Yes? So, so far, we see Matthew 5, 32, 99 for sexual immorality can unbound you if i were to use that term from the marital relationship and also death of a spouse you know there are some people that feel it is strange but true that even though their spouse has died they will not marry another they feel that they are eternally bonded, um, bonded in covenant even when their spouse has died that's right that's interesting yes so uh as we have just read Romans 7, 2 and 3, that releases us from the marriage act, which is death, as does des desertion. desertion by an unbelieving partner no longer willing to be married. So if this I is an interesting one. Yes, you find that in 1 Corinthians seven fifteen. So if I am an unbelieving partner, not a, mem not a Christian then, and I leave my husband. I'm not, I'm not a Christian, you know. And I decide to leave him. Then this marriage can be dissolved. Yes. If you, the unbelieving spouse, leaves me as the Christian. Mm -hmm. I don't know where you are. I tried to reach out to you many attempts, Sorry. but failed. Um, Paul is saying, let's read what Paul yes, says. Let's, read it. let's Paul, let's read what the scripture says. First Corinthians chapter seven and verse fifteen. 
But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. Mm -hmm. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. But pastor, <laughs> it doesn't matter if the person is unbelieving or yes, believing. Yes, yes, it is. It's not speaking of two believing um, members. It is one unbelieving spouse abandons the believing spouse. That's the context. And as the Bible gives it, gives it to us, that's how we relate to it. So if I'm a believing spouse and I abandon the marriage, and no matter what you do to, re to uh, reach out and reconcile... That's a different case. That's a different context. Different context. Okay. But this is what Paul is speaking about the unbelieving spouse abandoning the believing spouse All right. very important in that regard so the above do not exhaust the destructive factors that may lead to brokenness and divorce we mentioned a few but there it is not an exhaustive list so despite the heartbreak loss disruption and long-term consequences of divorce within the context of redemption Divorce and marriage to another that may follow are not viewed as un unpardonable sins beyond which there is no spiritual life and fellowship. So through repentance, confession, and the appropriate bearing of responsibility, grace can bring assurance of pardon, healing, and new beginnings. So, so what this is saying mm -hmm. is that there might be some members who were divorced and remarried outside of the biblical reasons as given. Mm -hmm. Remember, sexual immorality, the death of a spouse, or an unbelieving spouse abandoning the believing spouse. But we unfortunately, we see there are some members who divorced and remarried outside of these biblical reasons. Right. What we are saying here is that yes, they would have gone against God's biblical um, outlines, outlines yes. God's biblical principles. Yes. But it doesn't mean that they can't be redeemed. They have not committed the unpardonable sin. They can, through repentance, confession, and the appropriate bearing of responsibility, grace can bring assurance of pardon, healing, and new beginning. Let's read 1 John 1, 9. We first know it John very well. 1 John 1 and mm, verse, verse 9. I have it if, here. yes, mm -hmm. go ahead. If we confess our sins, yes. he is faithful and yeah. just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's it. Mm -hmm. So, That's it. like any other sin, if we commit uh, a sin because we were unfaithful in our, mar in our marital covenant with our spouse, or we divorced and remarried for other reasons outside of scripture, we would have sinned. But we are sin abounds. Grace much more Grace abounds. Much more abound. And so while marriage is part of God's original plan, singleness within the divine design is part of God's plan too. Exactly. So not because... Um, God put man in the context of marriage and the family when he made him. But singleness is valuable too. That's right. And it may be in the best interest of certain individual Christians to live singly. It's not everybody can get married, you know. It's not everybody can live with certain personalities. Paul speaks to this That's in right. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 7. And what does it say? For I would that all men were even as I myself. And Paul was single when he wrote this. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, and another after that. So we see that God's special acceptance and protection are over those who by choice or circumstances face life alone. God has a plan for the per per these special persons who choose to live alone. Indeed, Jesus was a single person. That's right. Yes. And many of the disciples exactly were, were single, single, especially the women. 
And friendship is a source of intimacy and of experiencing family. Good friends. When you have good friends can talk with, can see you through life challenges, these are sources of strength to single persons. Exactly. They say, it is said that good friend is better than pocket money. Okay. Exactly. That's right. The fellowship of the church, the household of God is available to all regardless of their marriage state. So people who are single must not feel left out. People must, they must not feel less valued. No. They must feel equally valued and, and um, as God intended us to be the body of in Christ the plan is, of salvation. The body of Christ is all inclusive. Very well, very and well. ministers to everyone. Our sexuality lies at the heart of our essence as human beings. Because when he made man, let's go back to the text Genesis in Genesis one, 1 verse, verse 27. 27. Yes. When he made man, he made man as sex, and he, and he made man as sexual beings. Yes. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, he created them. So God made us as sexual beings. So nothing is wrong in us uh, being made sexual beings. And this was in a sinless world. That's right. God made us sexual beings. Our gender qualities find expression in many areas of our, ex of our existence. So sexual intimacy, however, is reserved for marriage. And we shared that. Um, let, me, let, me, let me read that a little more. 1 Corinthians 7, verse verses 2 to 6. Amen. That sexual intimacy is reserved for marriage. Very yeah. important. Thank you. Nevertheless... Because of sexual immorality. That's 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 2. Yes. Yes, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her and likewise also the wife to her husband. So that expression outside of marriage is contrary to the divine purpose. So that is God's plan. Yes? Yes. And we must follow I the plan. I verse 4. We'll continue. Oh, continue, continue. Continue then. The yes. Verse the 5 and 6. The wife does not have authority over her own body. Wow. But the husband does. Yes. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body. But the wife does. Do not deprive one another except within consent for a time. That you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Very important. But I say this is a concession, not as a commandment. But I say this as a concession, not a commandment. Very well. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. We read that earlier. Yes, but each one has his own gift from God. One in this manner and another in that. Very well. So sexuality serves a unity function in marriage. Oh, yes. Which is distinguishable from the proactive, Pro procreative function. function. In other words, um, we should not just have sexual relationships when we only want children. Mm. And <clears throat> this is important to note. This may sound funny to us, but we used to have uh certain ascetic groups in the in the beginning of the adventist movement yes uh in the millerite times where they felt that they only should have sexual relationships when they want to have children wow. but this is not how god made it to be so so joy pleasure and delight are intended for married sexuality and the texts are provided for us to read them in our spare time. Right. We looked at Song of Solomon last week. Yes. And we saw that chapter 4, verse 16 to 5, 1 is the center of the book. 111 verses are before chapter 4, verse 16. 
and 111 verses are after chapter 5 and verse 1. In other words, uh, Solomon is saying these very verses are critical to my book. And what did he say in these verses? Let's look at Song of Solomon. This, listen, highly sexual passages that we will not be able to unravel maybe another time but not now but we will unravel it um, another time uh, song of solomon chapter 4 and verse 6 are you there go ahead all right let's let's find it all right chapter 4 and song of solomon comes after ecclesiastics so Song of Solomon 4 and verse 16. Awake, O north wind. This is the Shulamite wife, you know. Awake, O north wind, and come. Thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruit. Sexual relationship, you know, Sister oh, Fletcher. Yes. <laughs> Watch this now. Chapter 5, verse 1. I am coming to my garden, my sister, Solomon is saying. My spouse, I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. Mm -hmm. I have drunken my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. Very, very interesting. Oh, yes. So God intends that couples have ongoing sexual communion. Apart from that utilized for procreation. In other words... Outside of having babies, God expects us to have delightful, pleasurable, joyful sexual experiences. And, and, and you know, I think that bringing another human being into the world should be a pleasurable process. Exactly. God is all this wise. strengthens and protects marriage from inappropriate bonding with other persons than one's spouse. That's Very right. important. So bearing children is an option through which couples who are able and choose to do so participate in the blessing God intended children to be, as I said earlier, within the context of love and joy. Children should be brought into the world. And while marriages generally yield offspring, procreation is not viewed as an obligation incumbent upon every couple in order to please god in other words so yes. what we're saying not no, because you're I'm married sick. and having sexual relations you, you must have, have children, children. <laughs> that's right yes right. it doesn't necessarily Some say persons that believe that that is the way and they feel that if they don't have children god is not pleased no, not so right yes god values children but god expects each couple to work out their own situation accordingly you know it, it's it the the thoughts on this is it varies because some persons believe that they should allow the natural course of nature take place and have until your quiver is full whatever that quiver is <laughs> And whoever quivers, that's right. So My quiver only on, has only two. Ours have two, Pastor. <laughs> so children help parents understand about loving and trusting God. It, 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 you understand God as a parent when you become a parent. Exactly. You exactly. see what he goes through and you understand what, how much God loves us. As a father but at the same time what we are saying this is not an obligation on any couple to have children that's right very well not. they encourage the development of sympathy caring humility and unselfishness in families I believe once we a, a child comes into the family it makes it, it does something different for the family oh, yes I, I yes. remember when we had our children when we have Victoria and Carrington my husband's personality softened and he glowed and he was happy wow. because he felt a different feeling. I too, it's a different kind of emotion that comes upon us when we bear children. And some persons, even when they adopt, 
or take another child into the family, they experience the same measure of, of love, love and compassion. Very well. Parents are to provide, reach, and correct their children so they may, be, so they may come to know God. Choose biblical values and be prepared for responsible interdependence with others. So God's covenant of love with his people is the basic principle which undergirds and serves as an illustration for Christian family life. God has set the example. That's all we're saying. And in God's covenant, we experience love, forgiveness, commitment, acceptance, intimacy, and even sacrifice that our deepest needs might be met. And as we experience the gospel and seek to reflect it in our families, our relationships with each other are fashioned after the likeness of the divine relationship with humanity. So here God is just teaching us practical lessons in our family setting on how we can be his children. That's just it, you know. Practical lessons among us so we can be his child. Exactly. Christian family members are called to love to serve one another and to forgive just as he loves, serves, and forgives us. Strength and grace from God are, are promised to accomplish that to which God calls us. Yes. And we have those passages. We don't have the time to read them, but you, you uh, out there in the online, you can various write social down. media platforms can make note of it. That's right. Now, broken relationships with God and with fellow human beings are the tragic outcome of the fall. And you know the story with Satan in the mix just makes things bad. Jesus' mission, though, is restored through agape love relationships. And I have to smile because I thank God for his intervention in our lives. And you see the Bible passages that are provided um, there. Now, his church is an extension of his working in maintaining strong relationships and restoring those who have been damaged. As part of its mission, the church seeks to be an active agent in building, maintaining agape love relationships, and in healing and restoring relationships that have been broken. So, <clears throat> we know undoubtedly that there are many families that are broken many marriages that are broken down irreparably that's right but the church should be here as an agent of christ <clears throat> to bring agape love to extend care and forgiveness and healing and restoration to these families and to these marriages and you know pastor these are lessons that we have to exhibit in our home circle and as we learn to love each other, and the more, sometimes we hurt each other, we have to forgive. Exactly. And it is these lessons that we participate in in the home circle, we bring it to the church family. And we extend the same love and forgiveness to each member. Because we're not perfect. And we all need, the, need Christ's power to help us to bear and to share that kind of love in the church family. So in family life, there are some pillars. Yes. We will give about two today, and we'll give the rest next week when we close off on this topic. So pillar number one, the spiritual significance of relationships. A rabbi once asked the students, how can you tell the moment of dawn when the night ends and the day begins? The students pondered the question, one replied, is it when you can tell the difference between a find and a fig tree? No, replied the rabbi. Said another, is it when you can tell a dog from a sheep? No, said their teacher. Then we do not know, chimed the students. Please tell us. It is when you are able to look into the face of another human being and recognize him as your brother responded the rabbi until then the darkness is still with us okay 
Whether this discerning rabbi had read 1 John 2, 10 and 11, we do not know. But he echoed its profound truth. Quote, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. The first foundational pillar for family life is the biblical injunction that we should do what? Love one we another. should love one another. And this is critical. Let me read that again. The first foundational pillar for family life is the biblical injunction that we should love one another. It has been said that family life is the custodian of the church's relational theology. Family life is the custodian of the church's relational theology. Family life focuses on the building of close family relationships, especially in the home, but also in, in the, the church, church family. family. That's right. So Jesus elevated human relationships to a high moral plane, parallel with our relationship to God. As we true, as was true in the time of Christ, religious convictions and customs today can often stand in the way of basic human caring and compassion. And we have some text for you to read. And in some religious systems, the human connection with the divine becomes all important, often to the minimization or exclusion of human to human relationships. In other words, Sister Fletcher, what this is saying, we can't become so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. That's right. Um, we can't say we are so much in love for, for God that we can't see and hate the brother or we do not care for the brother who we can see or the sister who we can see. That's right. We expect that the relationship we have with God should be reflected in the human relationships that we have with each other. It is very, very important. Amen. So Jesus taught that the way we relate to one another has deep moral significance in the eyes of God. How we relate to people? Hmm. Let's, let's look at it, Sister Fletcher. Yes. Let's I look at one of these passages That's right. just to reinforce our point here, very important point in Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24. It says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother had ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Isn't that amazing? That's right. This is something we need to practice more. And as prophets of old had done, and apostles later would do, he focused upon human relationships as integral to spiritual life. So you can't be there praying, 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 and you, you're not living good with your neighbor, or with your family members, or with your mother, or your father, or your sister. Do your part to reconcile and leave it to God. Very well, very well. In doing this, he affirmed what God revealed to prophets of old and would again reveal to the writers of the New Testament. At one point, Paul summed up the whole law as being fulfilled in love for our fellow humans. He understood that this is the one evidence of whether we love God. Love for one another presupposes a loving relationship with God Amen. in which he pours his love into our hearts, enabling, enabling us to love, to love others. others. So that they may know we are Christians by, by our, our love. love. Very good. And we are to be courteous towards all men, tender-hearted and sympathetic. For this, is, this was the character Christ manifested when on earth. The more closely we are united with Christ, the more tender and affectionate will be our conduct. To, you hear that? The more closely united we are with Christ, so will be our conduct towards each other. And we this is written by Ellen White, uh, 
Testimonies to Ministers, page 377. So, as I shared last week, there is a pyramid, a triangle. We are, as human beings, we are at the bottom as we relate to our uh, persons, our family members, our church members, fellow church members, our spouses, our neighbors, whoever they are. As we get closer to God with our spouses, what we find is that automatically we get closer to each other. Yes? Very That's interesting. Right. So Jesus affirmed the family as Reaffirmed, a I should say. <laughs> yes. The family as an institution. Remember, we said last week that before sin, God instituted two main institutions. What were they? Or what are they? The family and the Sabbath. And, the family. and which is older? The family. The family is the older. Fam if it's even a few hours, That's right. the family is older. So marriage and family are primary structures for human relationships which were instituted in Eden for the benefit of humanity. Jesus, by his reference to families and family members, reaffirmed the institution of the family. And Jesus affirmed marriage. Yes. And he affirmed marriage between a man and a woman. And that is one man. And one woman. Yes. Monogamous, heterosexual relationship. relationship. No other did he bless. So when discussing marriage, Jesus affirmed God's plan by pointing his hearers back to the creation of his institution. That was the creation motif and for family. And God's commandments regarding it. And you can read all those passages of scripture. And at Cana, Jesus announced that his ministry would endorse and uphold marriage as it was meant to be. He uh, gave yes. Eve to Adam as a help meet, performed his first miracle at a marriage festival. It was no coincidence that Jesus performed his first miracle at a marriage festival or a marriage celebration. He was saying, listen, I was the one who made the marriage relationship. That's right. And here it is. I have reaffirmed and give my blessing on this marital relationship. That's right. So thus he sanctioned marriage, as you're just saying. Recognizing it as an institution that he himself had established. Ellen White wrote that Ministry of Healing, page 356. She says... Like every other one of God's good gifts entrusted to the keep of humanity, marriage has been perverted by sin. But it is the purpose of the gospel to restore its purity and beauty. And when we do that, when we restore the marital relationship, it res helps to restore the image of God in us. That's right. The oneness that exhibited in the trinity the triune god should be exhibited in a, or at our level in the human as human beings that must be demonstrated in our love for each other yes a loving relationship is a powerful testimony very well of the image of god in your life very well All very right. well i want god in my life so jesus affirmed children we talk about the union we're going to the children jesus loves children and while on earth, he identified closely with them, bade them come, elevated their faith as a standard for entrance into his kingdom. Yeah, you can't be one of these unless you enter the kingdom of God. And issued a severe warning to anybody who caused their feet to stumble. So you see all those people who commit crimes against children? Oh boy, they are going to have to face the judgment. His statements indicate that their families are extremely important to them. So how we choose to bring children in the world, God is looking on those circumstances too. There, there they are to be treated in the family setting with dignity, respect, and love. You hear that? Children must be treated with dignity, respect, and love. Not abuse. Not, Not abuse. abuse. Children are the heritage of the Lord. 
and we are answerable to God for our management of his children. Of his children. We are only stewards. That's right. He we gave are only them stewards. To us. He gave them to us to take for us to take care of them. That's right. And so he will hold us responsible oh. for how we treat the children. Christ placed such a high estimate upon our children that he gave his life for them. Treat them as the purchase of his blood. Patiently and firmly train them for him. Discipline with love and forbearance. Discipline with love and forbearance. And forbearance. Not out of anger. Oh boy. Not out of spitefulness. But discipline with love and forbearance. Adventist Home, Ellen White, page 279. And Jesus affirmed family life and family responsibilities. Jesus affirmed the responsibility of adult children toward their parents. So we looked at the, 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 the husband and wife relationship. We looked at children, how they should be treated what about the adult children towards their parents older um adults their parents yes and he rebuked the pharisee for the practice of korban yes you know what korban is pastor yes explain it all right and so what happened is that <clears throat> let, let, let's read it but we want to mention that that jesus affirmed the responsibility of adult children toward their parents by citing the fifth commandment what is the fifth commandment? Honor thy father, father and thy mother. That thy days. That their days. The only commandment with a promise. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> so he cited the fifth commandment as he rebuked the Pharisees for the practice of carbon. An offering, this is it, yes. which enabled adult children to skirt their appropriate financial duty toward parents. Touched by the death of the widow's son and recognizing that she would be all alone in the world with no male family member to care for her in her old age, Jesus showed compassion on her by raising her son from the dead. So what Jesus is saying, listen, you have a responsibility, adult children, to your parents when they cannot sustain themselves. We have a financial duty. So not because you are able... To practice a particular tradition or whether a one-off payment or some other ritualistic um, duties it releases you from your daily regular responsibility to your parents you are to care for them as long as they are in need of financial responsibility and also emotional and the psychological support so as you well take care of your your parents as much as you can financially and socially and psychologically. Later, he made arrangements for the care of his own mother at the time of his crucifixion. This is amazing. By commending her into the care of John and commending him to her. That's right. The difficult sayings. It should be noted that there are several references by Jesus to family relationships which have been called difficult sayings. Let's look at some. Some verses seem to imply that Jesus cared little for the relations of kinship of his own family or the families of others. You're going to read one? Yes, let's look at Mark 3, 33 to 35. And he answered them saying, Who is my mother? All my brethren. And he looked around about on them which sat about him and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So what he was saying, listen, you know who is my mother? You know who is my brethren? Those who do the will of God. As if he was renouncing or not giving much due respect to his family. Mm. And these are called difficult sayings. Mm. Some verses seem to imply that Jesus cared very little for the relations of kinship of his own family right. or the families of others. David Garland discusses each of the difficult sayings of Jesus regarding the family and concludes that Jesus did not hold a view of family that was subversive 
or did he see the family as a petty concern or an or an impediment to commitment to god far from undercutting the valuable nurture support and strength to be gained from membership in families jesus addressed the exclusive attitudes of those who trusted implicitly in biological kinship so jesus is saying listen um there is a responsibility yes as family members towards each other but this must not supersede our responsibility to god right. and to our and to what he has called us to do very important so faithfulness to god is important yes More important as it says here he redefined family royalties loyalties, loyalties rather putting them in perspective against the higher loyalty to god just as i expressed he opened the way for service to god to be done not only within the structure of the biological family but also in the wider circle of the church the family of god so some people say oh i can i can do my work among my own family not enough we need to be a part of the wider family of god that's right the family of the church and so um, we pause here today as we move to next week when we will continue the third and final segment but before we close sister Fletcher is there any comment from the on the social media platform or any questions any comments any questions uh, before we close All right, so persons are just saying that they're glad that Sister Fletcher, you know, has joined you today. Oh, she, they love that Sister Fletcher has joined me. Yeah, somebody <laughs> else says, uh, very interesting for sure. Oh, so that's Elder Oliver who said that um, he's glad that Sister um, Fletcher has joined you. Anne-Marie Carnegie says, very interesting for sure. Brother Randy Lawrence says, we need to learn to forgive more. Yeah, so those are some comments. From Very well. We, we appreciate those comments. Thank you. And we thank you for um, joining us today. And we hope you will continue to join us as we conclude the biblical and theological foundations of family life next Sabbath. So, Sister Fletcher, they enjoyed you coming today. My pleasure. My <laughs> All right, so we're going to ask you to close for us in prayer as we bring our Bible class to close. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for your words the foundation of our faith. We thank you for having a keen interest in our families. Lord, you created us and you want us to exhibit your image. So we ask that your Holy Spirit will attend unto each family in our church and in our country and in the world. We ask that your spirit will manifest in a remarkable way that will bring fathers mothers and children united in love so that we can all be ready to meet you when you come as a family in jesus name i pray amen amen, amen. thank you very much again for joining us looking forward to see you next sabbath have a wonderful sabbath have a wonderful sabbath he's calling you now to come Jesus is coming again, he's coming in power and glory to reign. Coming with all the heavenly hosts, what a glorious sight that will be. What a glorious sight that will be. What a glorious sight that will be.